Hey everyone, I wanted to welcome you to Encounter Church. I'm Pastor Craig Rice. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that this message inspires you, encourages you, and transforms you. Hey, what's going on, Encounter family? I'm Pastor Craig. I'm the lead pastor here at Encounter Church, and I can't wait to share this message with you. Let's go ahead and lean in. I've got a great word for you for the next few moments, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do in you and through you. We're going to go to two books uh, to start off with for my text today. Uh, The first one's going to be in Ephesians, and then the second one's going to be in Philippians. Ephesians 4 and 11 says it like this. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Philippians 2 and 5 in the New King James says it like this, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And that's where I want to take this title of of today's message from. And I want to just talk for the next few moments on this, Let this mind be in you. I've often looked at these two verses in really tried to, to dissect them, but it hasn't been till recently that I've kind of had this understanding a little more in depth of what's going on here. Paul says to the book, in the book of Ephesians, he says, hey, uh, we are part of the body of Christ, and we are building up God's church, and God gave gifts to the church. And so that the church could be built. And then he says the the reason why is so that we can be mature in the Lord. I don't know about you, but I've I've encountered a lot of immature Jesus followers. Um, I'll be the first to admit that there's been a lot of moments where I've been an immature uh, Jesus follower. And that's why the Apostle Paul tells the church in Philippi there in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you like it was in Christ Jesus. And so I want to kind of unpack this today, but I want to begin by saying this. I love God's church. And God's church is His plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is always going to be criticized. It's always going to be attacked. That's just part of being a part of the church. However, I want to go on record and say it today and remind you that even though it may be under attack and even though the assault may be strong, the church will never fall. Jesus said it like this, I will build my church and all the powers of hell cannot and will not conquer it. The church, we, you and I, the body of Christ, we are revival makers. We are kingdom builders and we are spiritual fire starters, and we are just getting started. I think that a lot of times we aim at getting into heaven. But in 2022, I want to challenge you this way, to spend more time this year getting heaven into us. Not so much us getting into heaven. That is a priority. However, may we this year take extra priority to allow heaven to get inside of us. See, the job of the church is not to adopt the culture or merely assess and analyze the culture, but it is to set heaven within the context of culture so that culture can see God at work in the midst of the chaos and conflicts of man. Romans 12 and 2 in the New King James says it like this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable will of God. So twice now we have heard this concept of letting the mind of Christ be in you and then renewing the mind. All along building God's church and becoming mature Christians. So the question that I would begin to ask is, what does the mind have to do with all of this? And is the mind 
intricately designed and connected to becoming a mature follower of Jesus. And so in those questions, I've got other questions to ask as we begin this this thought today. My question would be this. Have you ever felt spiritually depleted? Maybe you're feeling it right now. Have you ever felt spiritually stagnant or maybe even spiritually lethargic? You know, the new year brings about these new ideas and kind of a freshness. Yet maybe some of you have started your year and it's been bad already. Like you began and it's not the way you had anticipated it going. And so you feel like the tone of the year has been set because of a few bad days or bad instances. But the reality is today that we can, even though new seasons come and, 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 and life can be in a brand new, in a new year, we can still feel spiritually depleted. We can still feel spiritually lethargic. And we can still feel spiritually stagnant. You know those moments where you get so fired up about God and His church and the things that He's doing and you're riding on this, this ever uh, incline of hope and promise and faith and future. Yet, maybe you're at the place where it's kind of plateaued. It's not as exciting as it used to be. You don't feel the goosebumps like you used to. The warmth of His presence isn't there all the time like you used to have it. And suddenly now you feel lethargic. You feel like uh, you've become spiritually stagnant. The same energy that you used to have for God's house and God's and the things of God have suddenly become depleted. And I want to challenge us this year to renew our mind so that we can renew our spirit. We cannot be the same people, nor can we be the same church as we were in 2021 or in 2020. Or in 2019, we cannot keep looking back and saying, if only we could be like that. That is not our promise. That is not our future. And that is not our hope. And if we continually examine ourselves and compare ourselves with the previous years, then we miss out on the promise of the fulfillment of what God has for us in this coming year. We cannot continually stay the same people or the same church we were last year. We are called to become new. And I want to help you today remember and remind you today that this year can be your best year if you'll make it your best year spiritually. My prayer is that God would give you an an intense hunger for more of His presence, for more of His plan, for more of His purpose, to to hunger after Him, to, to feel your way towards Him, that this year would be your best year spiritually. And by making it your best year spiritually, it's going to be your best year ever, no matter how it has started already. So the question I have is this, what's setting the tone for your life? What is it that, that you're allowing to set the tone? Are you allowing the bad days, the the unfortunate events? Are you allowing the the circumstances that you've already encountered to set the tone for this year? Or have you allowed the good things, the positive things, the promises of God to set that tone? What is it? Every one of us is allowing something to set the tone of our year. We've often said that we want to live, love, and look like Jesus. But often we wrestle with the how. It's good to say and, it's, and we understand this is what we need to do, but oftentimes we wrestle with the how. The how is what develops discipleship within us. Uh, a lot of us are followers of Jesus, but we really need to become disciples of Jesus. Disciples of Jesus. What does discipleship look like? And, and I want to kind of break this down. We have heard uh, that there are two sides of our brain, the left side and the right side. Uh, And if we would understand a little bit about that, we understand that the left side is the analytical side. It's it's the problem-solving, strategy-giving. It's the conscious thought of an individual. Uh, When we think of careers and those kind of things, the left side of the brain, we typically think of like accountants. They're very analytical and they're very data-driven. Uh, and then we hear about the right side. The right side's the creatives, right? They're the musicians. They're the writers. They're, they're the ones that begin to, to form and bring color into the world, right? They're the creatives. And, and what I want to help us with is that many times our discipleship in following Jesus is based upon a left-brain Christianity 
not a right brain Christianity. We were designed to use our entire brain that God gave us. Recent studies have actually shown that we use both sides of our brain, but we use them differently. But we have reverted as a culture more on the left side than we have on the right side. And I want to break this down spiritually with discipleship and how we live. The left side has been our problem solving. It's our strategies. It's our conscious thought. The right side is the relational, emotional side. It's where our identity comes from, and it's the assessment of our surroundings. It's the subconscious thought. So the left side is the conscious thought. The right side is the subconscious thought. So it's like this. When you walk into a room, you quickly evaluate the room based on a subconscious right-brained thought. You take a look at the room, and you instantly know who is in there that likes you, who's brand new that you want to talk to, or who you want to avoid. That is an instant connection with your right brain. It comes subconsciously. Your left side then engages into the actions that you are about to take and becomes the dialogue in which you control your life with. So the left side will look at the room and go, yeah, I don't want to talk to them, so I'm going to do everything I can to avoid them. I'm going to hit the punch table because they're talking to somebody, and then I'm going to go get involved in another conversation. The left side begins to make a strategy and begins to problem solve, all the while the right side is processing the subconscious, relational, emotional sides. So your cell phone right now has two processors. One that processes the cellular signal of your phone to make a phone call, receive a text message, maybe to even get on the internet. The other processor is running your apps. They are making sure all your apps are running. And this is the difference between the left brain and the right brain. The left brain is controlling the apps. What you open, you're consciously opening an app to get in to do work or to surf the web or to see uh, who's posting the latest video on TikTok. The right side of your brain is the cellular service and the text messaging system that is running in the background even when you aren't aware of it. Now, because we have lived so much in the problem-solving state in our culture, because Jesus followers have lived more with the left side. The left side of a Jesus follower's brain says like this, I know I shouldn't lie, so I'm not going to. Okay, I know I should give, so I'm going to. I know I shouldn't steal, so I'm not going to. I know I shouldn't have uh, an adulterous relationship, so I'm not going to. I know I should be a good citizen, so I'm going to. It's the conscious side of the brain. You're going to make those decisions. However, because we have become so left-brained in our Christianity, we've actually lost insight to the right side of how we're supposed to follow and live like Jesus. Jesus and the early church did not live based on strategy and and problem solving uh, with their left side. They focused more on the right side. So when they were approached with a situation, they instantly had a response. They didn't have to stop and think about it. When Jesus was approached with people that needed healing and they would call out to him, Jesus stopped what he did and was doing and performed a miracle. He didn't have to analyze it. He didn't have to think deep thoughts about it. He didn't have to try to problem solve and figure this out. Is this a good thing to go talk to somebody? Is this going to ruin my reputation? Jesus was a friend of sinners. And being a friend of a sinner was not a left brain philosophy because a left brain says I should not hang out with those people Jesus was focusing on the right side the relational and emotional side and modern day Jesus followers have lost connection with our relational emotional side and we've done everything with the problem solving solution side creating strategies and having conscious thought it's if I have a bad day can I worship in this moment instead of worshiping through the bad day just because it's the natural subconscious thought. 
Now, this may be a little deep for us today, but I want to transform our mind, renew our mind to the way God designed it so that we don't have to second guess what we do or how we live. We just do it because it's relational and it's emotional that we get a hold of the presence of God, that we connect with people based on the right side of our brain, not trying to analyze it and come up with strategies with the left side. So we see that, that the left side of the brain, it knows what to do. It will count the cost. So when Jesus says things like, take up your cross daily and follow me, that's not a left brain decision. That's a right brain subconscious thing to do. And that's why many times we cannot pick up our cross and follow him daily is because we have used the left side to count the cost. What is this going to, and how is this going to affect my day? How is it, do I want to, do I feel like it? That's a left brain philosophy. It's a left brain idea. The right brain instinctively responds to all situations with the mind of Christ. It's, it's instinctively doing it. It's, it's, it's when, when generosity is presented. We don't have to go back home and look at the bank account. We just do it. We, we, when we're approached with the homeless, it's not that we have to consciously think about, do I do that? We just do it. It's, it's when somebody says, hey, I have a need. We don't just say, I'm going to pray about it, and we think about it. We actually stop and do it. That's right-brained Christianity, that we instinctively do it because that is the mind of Christ. And Paul prayed it, let this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. Maybe it's exactly what he's talking about in Ephesians when he says we should be mature believers and followers of Jesus. So may I present this idea that maybe the immaturity that we have in Christianity today is based upon our left brain making strategies and problem solving. So when we are faced with a distress or a crisis or a situation that is beyond our ability to comprehend or to see the way out of, when we are dealing with a distress, when we're dealing with a problem, when we're dealing with an issue like all of a sudden uh, the, the, the world is, ca- is caving in around us, the, the sky is falling, that suddenly we cannot see a way out. And it's our left brain engaging to problem solve. How do we figure this out? How do we fix this? When the reality is, is we should also engage the right side. And the right side allows emotional security and maturity. Could it be that we are living in an age where we are so disconnected from the right side that the reason why we have uh, conflict, the, we, the reason why we have uh, a crisis of faith, the reason why when every wind blows against us and it seems like our house is falling, that we panic and suddenly we're asking if God is really there. It's because we are using the left side of our brain and not the emotional response. Because the emotional, relational response of the right side of our brain says, God is with me. God is for me. And if God's done this before, he's going to do it again. He is my healer. He is my savior. He is my deliverer. He is my provider, and that is the right side engaging. It's not a left side that has to have the problem solved and the strategies in place, but now it's the right side that says my relationship with God is stronger than the present storm that I'm in. See, if, if, we're gonna, if we aren't using spiritually using our right brain when it comes to that distress, those problems, those, those, those trials, they, they throw us into this complete tailspin of crisis, and suddenly our belief is so quickly thrown away. You see, the right side of our brain governs our emotions and the awareness of our bodies. And the disconnection of our bodies from our experience with God is a direct consequence of half-brain Christianity. The right side of our brain is where we experience an integrated sense of the body. And I re- The Bible says this, that Jesus was often moved with compassion. And the Greek word for compassion is this, to be moved in one's intestines or guts. It was a body response. That's what compassion was. Compassion is not a strategy. Compassion is a response to emotion. See, left-brain Christians tend to lose the sense of God in our body. 
Right brain Christians continue to grow to experience God in their bodies. It's the warmth. It's the goosebumps. It's the feeling of electricity. It's the fire within us. It's, it's when, when we lose this, when we lose that connection and that touch, it means that our right brain is not running well. In fact, the Bible says that it's our responsibility to feel for him, to touch him. It's the right side of our brain that engages him. Paul is is speaking in Acts 17. He says, This purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. See, our brains draw life from our strongest relational attachments to grow our character and develop our identity. So who and what we love ends up shaping who we become. Okay, so the Greek word for character is literally character, and it means this, an exact expression or impression of. Like this, the old time when they would send a letter or a document, they would pour a puddle of, of, of melted wax on the document, and they would take the seal or the signet, and they would place a stamp on it to let them know that the sender was, was valid and authentic. And when Jesus uses words like this and the apostles uses words like this, it means to have an exact expression or impression of. So when he says, let this mind be in you like it was in Christ, it's an exact expression or impression of who he was. To become a mature believer is an exact expression and impression of who he was. Jesus spent three years building up the character of the disciples so that they could live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Matthew 22 and 37 says, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. All your mind. It's this concept that our mind controls the feelings and intricately designs our body. And if we're loving him only with a left-brained philosophy or thought, then we're missing out on a full-brained, following Jesus kind of Christianity where we can experience both the emotional and relational and connect it also with the analytical and the problem-solving. Because if I tap into the right side first and I know God is with me, then I instantly put it over into the left brain category that he is my problem solver. It's the identity that God wants to get in you. Your identity is created within the right side of your brain. And identity is developed through attachment. Because what you are attached to develops your identity. And like I just said a few few seconds ago, is that who and what we love shapes who we become. So when Jesus says, love him, love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, guess what? If we love him, it shapes us into who he wants us to become, and our identity becomes an exact impression and expression of who he is. So if identity develops through attachment, Let me go back in time to the Old Testament and remind you of somebody that Jesus reminded the disciples of. And Genesis 19 and 26 says, But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. In Luke 17 and 32, Jesus said, Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you lose it. And if you let go... You will save it because your identity is shaped by your attachments. So could it be that you are attached to your guilt? You are attached to your shame. You are attached to your problem. You are attached to your distress. You are attached to the thing that is burning down around you so much so that you actually become like it. Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed by God. Angels came, rescued Lot and his family, and as they're leaving, the angels specifically said, don't look back. I'm burning the attachments that you had to this city. Lot and his family are running from the city 
but because Lot's wife still had an attachment, a love for that city and the things of that city, she looked back and became a pillar of salt. She longed and she lingered for something that was in the past, something that she was being set free from, something that she was being delivered from. She was attached to what was. See, continually looking behind you will cause you to become salty. Maybe the reason why you're such on, you're so on edge all the time, so easily offended, so quick to give a word of, of, of conflict, a word that, that tears others down, or maybe the reason why you're so negative, you're so salty is because you're continually looking back on what was and your connection and attachment to the past has not yet been destroyed. We have to, in 2022, we have to stop longing for what was and start longing for what is and what will be. Jesus said it like this, and and he's, he's, he's telling these disciples he had already gone to the cross, he had risen, and now he's walking. And he shows up with a few disciples, and this is the conversation that they had as Jesus is walking with them. And the disciples said, we had hoped that he, being Jesus, was the Messiah who has come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Jesus is standing with them, but they could not see him because they were still so attached to the trauma that they had experienced that they missed that Jesus was standing right with them in this season. They were using a left-brained philosophy to problem-solve. I saw him die. There is no way he can live again. I saw him buried, and there's no way he could be risen again. The dead do not rise in my analytical left brain thinking. But the right side says that Jesus can rise again. The the right side says my relationship with him is stronger than the grave. It's stronger than the cross. My right side says I don't want to miss Jesus because I continually look back. I want to challenge you. Don't miss Jesus this year because you are still attached to the temporary. The left side of the brain was what Lot's wife dealt with in Sodom. The left side of the brain is what these disciples dealt with on the road to Emmaus with Jesus. The right side of the brain says my relationship that if he says it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust him fully. In fact, Ezekiel 16 and 49 says Sodom sins. You know, this city that was destroyed, this city that God took out, this city that Lot's wife was attached to, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. Wow. It was not the sexual nature that we so often find ourselves comparing Sodom to. But it was the ability to have self-sufficiency in that moment for what they enjoyed while they allowed the poor and the needy to suffer outside their door because they were more focused on themselves with the left side of their brain than they were able to comprehend that the poor and the needy and those on the outside still need a relationship with God. It's the connection that Lot's wife had. She was attached to the city. She was not attached to her purpose. She was attached to what was. She was not attached to her destiny of what will be. So I am challenging us, church, this year. May we see, may we hear, and may we say what no one else is this year. And it begins with our attachments. May we burn our attachments to the past to the ground, while we look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. May we separate today the problem-solving, the analytical side, so that we may tap into the relational, emotional side, so that we may follow Jesus by loving Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And I promise you, the moment you separate from the attachments that have designed and impacted your identity, you get a new identity with God. In fact, the Lord gave me this word to give you today, and that is this in Zechariah 9 and 12. 
He says this, come back to the place of safety. All you prisoners who still have hope, I promise this very day that I will repay two blessings for each of your troubles. He's going to repay double what you've experienced. So why in the world would we maintain our attachments to our troubles when there are two blessings for every one of them that we've experienced? I'm trying to free you today. I want to free you from a left-brain theology and enter into a full-brain theology where we realize that the emotional, relational connection with God controls every part of our being. We do something every year and. I'm going to encourage you to, to partner with us. We call it our, our Future Ready Offering. And generosity in this kind of aspect doesn't make sense to left-brain Christians. But to right-brain Christians, it makes all the sense in the world because it's instinctively what we do. And it's an opportunity for us to leave a legacy of who we are for generations to come so that the sins of this culture, the sins of my time, are not laziness and pride and gluttony, but they are opened up and forgiven so that I may focus on the needy and the poor. And our future ready is for evangelism and expansion. Every year we do this offering, we take this. This is above and beyond our tithing. This is an absolute an opportunity for us to give above and beyond. You can go ahead and check it out on our website at EncounterIdaho.com. And you can click Give Now, and there'll be a link for you to give to the Future Ready offering expansion and growth of our church. May we open our minds to see the revelation that God has for us this year. May our minds be open, not just with the left brain, but the right brain as well. And my prayer is this today. May this mind be in you as we build God's church together. We pray over you. Father, I thank you so much for the words and the challenge that you've given us today. May we take this, build on it. May we formulate thoughts and talks and ideas with our friends and people that we're connected to around this concept. May you unlock the full potential of the brain and the mind that you have created within us. And so today I declare that this mind will be in me this year as it was in you. Today, Father, I'm praying for those that want to make a fresh start. It's a brand new year. It's a great time for them to say yes to you. And so today, I'm asking that for every individual that is questioning their faith, wanting to make a fresh start, that they would simply say this, God, I give you my life. I give you my worries. I burn the attachments to my past so that I may have a double blessing in my future. And today, I receive you, I accept you, and I believe that you are my Lord and my Savior and I say yes to making a fresh start with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm praying a blessing over you and your family this year. 2022 is going to be a great year because you're going to make it the best year spiritually. Let's tap into the right side of our brain as we engage the left side. And let's be full-brained Christians. May this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. Be blessed. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you to take this message you just heard and allow Jesus to transform your soul. Today, our prayer is that you have an amazing week. Thanks for being a part of the Encounter Church family. 